All right. How's it going, guys? Good, good. Glad to be here. All right. So for those of you uh, who are tuning in, um, obviously, uh, you know who's who's here with us. But uh, we got Chase from Prairie Artisan Ale. we got Bob from St. Somewhere, two guys I, uh, um, I think are on top of their game right now. Uh, wow. Uh, in the brewing world, and so some of you might be thinking well, it's kind of weird that we've got somebody from Tartan Springs, Florida, some from Oklahoma, to get an interview. What's the connection here? Well, they've brewed a lot of collaborations together, so we're going to talk about those. Um, and so I thought it'd be cool to bring them both in together, and they uh, very kindly ag agreed to do so, put through the ringer here tonight. So Bob, I want to start with Bob a little bit here. Bob, you're you're at Saint Somewhere in Tarpon Springs, Florida. When did you start up with? When did you start Saint Somewhere? Uh, 2006, which yeah. in, in the Florida craft beer world, that was like the that was the, the beginning of time. Right. And what was what was the I guess what was the what the draw to open up in a time like you said where. Um, you know, Florida isn't really seeing much of a craft beer movement until probably only the last year or two. Um, well, I, I, I was coming to a crossroads in, in my, you know, former life, former career, which was retail. I just couldn't couldn't stomach that anymore. And, uh, you know, I've been a home brewer for about eight years, ten years, and, you know, won some competitions and what have you that, that gave me a little a little more credibility to come home to Ann and propose the idea. <clears throat> uh, the, the timing was right, because even though 2006 doesn't sound that long ago, uh, when we opened, there were less than 1,000 craft breweries in the U.S., and now there's, uh, what, 160,000, something like that? Right. 3,500, some, somewhere ridiculous. So yeah, I mean, you, it allowed you to come in at, at the right time. Um, I think because you got you had, you were able to establish yourself. And it's funny you mentioned I won some homebrew tournaments, and a lot of people now opening breweries up are like, well, you know, uh, my parents think it's good. My best friends always tell me it's good. Ah, I'm gonna open up a brewery. <laughs> I've never won, I've never won shit. <laughs> Literally nothing. I've never won anything brewing wise. I think well, you're doing pretty good. With, with that said, I've I've never I've never entered any other competitions as a professional, ex just to, except the Florida um, the Florida Brewers competition. But you know, no GABF or any of those. Chase, did you enter any competitions? You just got stiffed. <laughs> I mean, we entered like we're in GABF this year. Um, right. But I mean, really, more just because it's fun, I guess. For us, where we are, you know, we can hop in the car and drive over. To Denver and um, make a few days of it. So we entered just just for the sake of you know it's not too too difficult for us to do as far as you know planning geographically going there being involved. Um, it's not it's it's pretty easy. I hear it's a blast. I I, I was going to go this year. I couldn't make it, but I, I hear it's a blast. Have you, have you been? In, have you, both of you guys been in the past? I've never been. Yeah, I mean, I know for me, the bi the biggest part is really the events and stuff that goes on around it. Um, so, you know, we'll be doing a couple of different pouring events, dinner. Um, we we really have fun with, with the side events more than the, the, the big show. That's really, you know, become an event more for newer beer drinkers, I feel like. And then the cool stuff really happens around the around the edges. Yeah, sure. I've heard, I've heard that, too. Um, hopefully, hopefully next year I make it. Um, I guess this is a kind of a general question for both of you, but um, and then I want to go back to Chase a little bit. Uh, but both of you guys, I guess we'll start with Bob. What I guess there's a pretty definite style Saint Somewhere or a, a sense of um, identity Saint Somewhere has, and I guess what would you identify as the style of beer that you guys are most proud of brewing, and what kind of identifies Saint Somewhere as a brewery? <laughs> uh, wow, I, I I try to. Try to not identify ourselves with this style, to be honest. Uh, you know, Florida saisons. I, there's no other way to wrap any kind of any kind of name around them. A lot of the stuff is 
just a, a, a mixture of styles that uh, you know really don't make any sense on paper, but in the bottle they work out. Yeah, and, and I guess you're drinking it, I'm drinking it, uh, the Cynthiana. Um, it is a beautiful looking beer, and I guess would you mind describing exactly what Cynthiana is? Uh, the the makeup of it is a pretty simple recipe for a saison. Pilsner malt, a little bit of wheat, a little bit of rye. Uh, but what makes this beer what it is, is uh, Cynthiana grapes, also known as Norton grapes. And they're grown primarily in the, let's say, the southern Midwest. They're really famous in Oklahoma. Yeah. They're thought to be the original... North American red grape, from which all other native North American red grapes were hybridized off of, except for muscadine and things like that, that most people don't even consider them grapes. They're somewhere between a I don't know, cherry and a grape. <clears throat> but it that's adds a, a pretty distinctive character to the beer. Yeah, it's got it's beautiful. It's very I mean the smell is the smells phenomenal. You pick all that you pick all that up and the smell and the taste is it's fruity, it's bright, it's crisp. Um, you definitely have a little bit of the Saison funk to it. But um, Chase, what are you drinking on? Uh, it's, I, I guess I'm drinking my own beer too. So it's um, Pirate Bomb. It's our uh, Rum Barrel Age Bomb. Bomb in itself is a funny story, but we'll be releasing the new batch of this this week. And, and it's super cool, this one. We used a lot of... Um, Super old rum barrels that um, were used in a like Solera style distillery. That means like there's way old rum in it, so you have some interesting oxidation, some really bright tropical you know coconut notes and stuff. And they play well with the beer that's you know full of chili peppers and, and chocolate and coffee. So um, it's an interesting beer for us though because it never was anything I set out to make. Um, we just on a whim brewed a batch of of the base beer and. Like people just went nuts for it, so now like now we make a lot of it, and it definitely starts to have us kind of trail away from I think our general philosophy in beer making and in what we do. But it's kind of you know what do you do when you got something that a lot of people want, and um, you know it's got to deliver. So so it's an interesting interesting thing that's kind of happened to us. That um, for better or worse, we're proud of it, but um, more or less. We, we just brewed a batch just to say, what the heck, let's brew this crazy stout, and then it, it got out of control. What would you say, and you are mentioning something there, what would you say is the is what you typically do? How would you characterize that? I mean, we're definitely doing uh, American farmhouse beers, um, just rustically fermented and, you know, naturally conditioned. And, and the idea was that uh, in our state, they, a liquor store cannot sell refrigerated beer. So I wanted to brew styles that really more or less played to um, the disadvantage that we had in the beers we made. The, the, the styles we make um, are very sturdy, and they, they hold up to being abused, and that certainly happens here in our state. So um, that's really what initially caused me to pursue them. And um, so everything's just kind of play off of that, although we have started to get into spontaneously fermented beers, and um, I think that's a direction I want to head a little further into as we get into these colder months and um, using a cool ship and stuff like that to, to make our beers. So we have this crazy stout world we live in, but, you know, we're kind of half and half between stouts and farmhouse beers. And, and an interesting thing is that we really produce beer in two different facilities, and mine is, yeah, almost, you know, predominantly – farmhouse driven while the other facility is a little more modern and capable and that's really where we produce most of our stouts. Cool. What would you say makes your beers more sturdy for non-refrigeration? Um, I mean it's it's the really the different Britannomyces strains that we we, we play with and use in our beers. Um, we typically bottle condition with Britannomyces and so the oxygen scrubbing that that does and just the overall um, ability that bread has to stabilize beer. Um, it just to me they just get better the longer they sit, and and you know especially knowing that they're going to sit warm on a shelf. I know that the 
different you know yeast and bacteria in the bottles is going to continue to stay active. Sure, Bob, you got you guys have uh, you guys use, use open fermentation at St. Summer, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for the people who maybe not don't know what that is, can you maybe uh, explain exactly how you guys ferment your beers at St. Summer? Uh, we use, <clears throat> and we were probably one of the first breweries in the U.S. or one of the, you know, few to start using uh, red wine fermenters. And they're uh, for for farmhouse ales. They're absolutely perfect. They're straight side, flat bottom, uh, you know, slight cone <clears throat> helps you get the yeast out. Uh, but more importantly, the, the tops are completely open. You know, they have a lid with a, like a little pulley system that you can pull the lid off to the side. Um, so that allows whatever is in the air to react with the beer. We, we do, we do um, keep our house strain going. Uh, so that's the dominant yeast. But we bolster it with, uh, with you know, the native Florida fauna, let's say. Uh, we did uh, straight Florida yeast. Uh, we'd be brewing a lot of uh, uh, a lot of vinegar. <laughs> yeah, that's, that was gonna, that was gonna be my next question. So I'm happy you answered it already. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's especially in the summer. I mean, there's so you know when the humidity peaks, there's just so much mold and nastiness in the air that uh, our, our house strain, fortunately, is is. Uh, strong enough to, you know, power through it. What was the draw to open fermentation in the first place? I mean, I, I got to imagine uh, opening a brewery, it might, it might not be the most efficient way to get yourself going. Um, well, my, let's say my uh, mentor was uh, Ron Jeffries. Um, I, I knew I didn't want to do a lot of uh, barrel aging like he was doing, so I just didn't have enough room. And plus, you know, in the in the dark ages, 2006, 2007, <laughs> nobody was doing barrel aging. I, I, you know, I had no idea, you know, the process. Didn't want to, you know, bug him more than I already was. But I wanted to do something in in that vein, uh, just a real simple, you know, kind of antique type rustic beer right. uh, and the the one way I knew to, to, to get that was some wild yeast or open fermentation rather than uh, than barrels and and I've stayed with that we uh, really haven't done a barrel aged anything uh, kind of our whole shtick is to get the most out of uh, the wild yeast you know without uh, without barrel aging right is that one of the ties that you think brought you guys together is the um the fact you guys both have a strong emphasis on these rustic style beers, wild yeast, um, like Chase put it, sturdier saison beers, farmhouse sales. Yeah, almost oh, definitely. I think the thing that brought us together is because Bob is like a really damn nice dude, and um, I was I was young and trying to figure out a lot of things, and and, and Bob's always made a point to be um, very helpful to brewers that have questions and need information. I mean, the story, as the story goes, um, it, it, if we want to get to there as far as from my standpoint, yeah. um, like 2010-ish, um, I was working for our state's uh, DHS office helping elderly with their Medicare benefits and working on a project that was called Red Bud, um, was where I really got started and interested in saisons, and and I definitely had some of Bob's beers before then, and reached out to him as far as uh, bottle conditioning and, and his recommendations within the style and and really how to do it. And I mean, he walked me through step by step, and um, it was a weird time in my life, but you know, I never forgot how how helpful he was. And um, you know, a year or so later, I, I've kind of realized that I wanted to do Prairie and, um, you know, knew that working with him was something I definitely wanted to do because just kind of from the beginning, um, he'd really helped me kind of start to see these styles of beer and, and identify, you know, just how special they, they really can be. That's cool. Bob, Bob definitely is a nice person. Uh, I think 
Bob, but, uh, yeah, yeah, we met. Once you guys time. got my check, then. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we met for the first time at the, uh, the the Key West Brew Fest this last weekend, or two weekends ago. Right, two weekends ago. Yes, two yeah. weekends ago. And uh, Bob's there, and your wife and your daughter are there. My wife, my wife is like, those are the nicest people in the world, you know. And oh, you don't know. She's a huge, she's a huge Saint Somewhere fan now. My wife takes in the, the the you know the outsides of everything before she actually like you could you could produce the worst beer in the world and she would love you just because of how nice you are. <laughs> it's a selling point, like anything else. Yeah, hey, you know, but you don't. It's not. It's you. You know, you're the selling point. It's good. I want to get into something else. I mean, what? Um, this is kind of, I guess, maybe backtracking a little bit. But what's the meaning behind Saint Somewhere? The name itself. Um, well, when we were, when Ann and I were, you know, putting everything together, um, we're, we're both Florida natives, and we're both kind of parrot heads, you know, Buffett fans. <clears throat> and Saint Somewhere is a line in a in a Buffett song, but it's not. It's not the title of the song, so it's it's not uh, copyright protected. Let's say it's stealable, <laughs> uh, but it, it it made so much sense with what we were going to do. Uh, I, I knew at the onset we were only ever going to do Belgian farmhouse ales. Sure. Um, and a lot of the Belgian breweries are Saint whatever. You know, they're either attached to a monastery or they just you know they choose the name. So the Saint part made sense, and Saint somewhere had the floor to tie to it, so that just kind of all fell together and worked. Is there not a brewery that uses your last name, like is, is in in France? Yeah, uh, well, it's it's Saint Sylvestre, so it's R E on the end instead close, of close enough. Plus, plus, I thought that you know it's yeah, that's a little little pretentious. <laughs> you know, the lawyer, we can we can handle that. Says says the guy with you know Saint Bob on the back of his shirt. <laughs> I've seen that shirt. <laughs> that, <laughs> that wasn't shirt was. that was. I that think was when I was there, me. when I was there, I wanted one of those shirts, but um, I think I was too fat for any of the sizes you still had. <laughs> well, I didn't get one. <laughs> oh man. Chase, where'd you come up with the name Prairie? Well, um, so Prairie, when I started Prairie, um, I guess I should kind of begin with the fact that an interesting link that Bob and I have is that we both sell beer um, to Shelton Brothers importers. And um, they help us get beer in little spots all over the country um, in a really kind of awesome way. Um, but when I was working on my Redbud project years ago, um, I had began to establish a relationship with those guys uh, back then, sending them beers and stuff. So they wanted to sell our beer, um, and starting Prairie, I knew that was going to be a possibility for us. So I picked a name that I felt identified more with where we were regionally in the country versus being too hyper-local um, or anything like that. So. I wanted to, to, to identify with where we were and become maybe more of a, a representative of this part of the country um, for the rest of the country, I mean, even and as well for maybe around the world. Um, we ship beer to a lot of funky spots, and so we feel like we're able to more embrace kind of where we, where we come from um, on a larger basis versus just Oklahoma or, you know, whatever, Tulsa, but this part of the world, more or less. So um, that's really what what I chose, and, and I even argued with my wife a little bit about it because I think it's a name. It's a word that is some people are a little nervous about saying or spelling, uh, prairie. Um, but you know, hopefully, we've made it enough of a, a household name that it's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's got that a, that weird AI thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what What was your What was your I guess Chase. What was your initial goal with Prairie? Was it always to uh, distribute as far and wide as you could, or was it kind of to stay um, a local? I, I don't know if you guys can see in the corner here. I got I got one of these like torrential Miami downpours happening right outside. It'll last for about 15 minutes and rain cool. about three feet, and then stop. Um, I guess going back, 
of that question. Was it always your, was it always your goal to uh, distribute as far and wide as you could, or was yeah. it? It was. It was our goal. Um, you know, I wanted to use Prairie as a way to break all the rules and in, in business more or less, and just do do what was fun. Um, and not that that's not important, but we did it with the idea that if we could reach those places with the unique beer, um, we could like we could go to those places and 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 live through our beer. So um, we sell beer in places like Australia and Singapore, um, uh, other kind of like Brazil, you know, because uh, we think that that it's awesome. And so maybe next year we go there and brew a beer or pour at a festival and. Um, those people get to try something interesting, and, and I think for me or my brother or anyone else involved, our lives are more enriched for getting to be involved in something on that kind of scale because um, it's not it's not a normal deal, you know. So um, that was my goal, and if it worked, great. And if not, I guess we could just you know come up with Plan B. But so far, it's worked, and since we started two years ago, you know, we've we've left the country a few times for festivals and collaborations and. And um, those are good, and I suppose help the brand and people see it. But more than anything, it, it allows us to um, experience the world, and and I think it gives us a lot of interesting perspective to bring back to what we do in our facility here in the Midwest. Yeah, you guys are becoming brewers are becoming like modern day uh, rock stars. You know, it's like <laughs> it's, it's pretty the fun. lines out the door of your brewery are. Are two blocks, you know, people wait in line at six in the morning to get the new releases. Uh, the festivals are selling out all over the world. I've noticed Brazil has a really big, uh, and they're really into American craft beer down there. I noticed, I guess, through social media sites. Um, have you noticed that selling to Brazil? Have you noticed that at all? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's really everywhere. People are just like, you know, it's it's definitely a, a thing that's been happening over the past couple of years where. Um, either expats or just you know foreign kind of countries in general are just getting excited about the interesting thing that brewers are making here. I mean, I, I think we're making more interesting beer in the United States than anywhere else in the world. So people are excited about it everywhere, and um, you know, I think that even the beers we're sending to a place like Brazil is inspiring brewers down there to be more adventurous and, and try things and experiment and not be afraid to go against, you know, what probably most people drinking is light lager. So right. um, it, it's just crazy to see that, like, what we're doing is actually influencing people when we really did it for more or less selfish reasons of just wanting to use use the company, you know, in a way for us to explore. It's kind of coming full circle in a, in a way that's very cool. It's, yeah, I mean, it's I would do the same thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bob, you distribute pretty widely too. Yeah, um, not not quite as far as uh, Chase. Uh, mainly, Thailand, our, our production is you know very low. Um, but that initially that was really out of out of uh, necessity rather than you know wanting to take over the world. Um, and that's we, I want to ask you about that. When I interviewed Wayne from Cigar City, um, Wayne was telling me they distributed to Europe before they could they could find accounts even in Florida. Um, yeah. What's what's that all about? Uh, Florida was a tough market. It still is. Um, prior to 2001, uh, there was a container size law where the only beer you could buy uh, had to had to be packaged in a 12 ounce, 16 ounce. 32 ounce bottle or a gallon or more, so that eliminated 750s, 33 uh, milliliter, or I'm sorry, 330 milliliter. It eliminated pretty much every ex import except for, you know, the AB stuff, you know, the backs and you know Molson and right. all that kind of stuff. So there there was no craft beer market until they repealed that law, and you know, then there was just a just a flood of great beer coming in around 2002, 2003. Um, so Florida is is still a good 20 years behind a, a lot of the country in uh, let's say their their 
not not beer education because there there are so many homebrew clubs and so many breweries opening. But I, it, we if you follow the legislative session this year, you know exactly what Bob's talking yeah. about. Yeah, let's say beer maturity. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. Um, Florida right now, for better or worse, it's better for some breweries and worse for breweries like me, is still in the uh, IPA, double IPA, imperial stout, and flavored beer stage. Flavored um, beer? What do you talk? What do you mean by flavored beer? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> 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 with flavorings. Sorry. Uh, you know, your, your peanut butter, lemon, chipotle, raspberry, you know, porters. Oh, we're going to get that. Anyway. <laughs> when, when when we hit the market, uh, you know, I, I, I had no plans of ever going outside Florida. And uh, we figured out, like, almost immediately that if we didn't go out of Florida – we were going to die a pretty short death. That's amazing. And around around that time when, you know, we were on life support, uh, I get a call from uh, a distributor in Philadelphia, and he was going to pick us up as kind of a novelty because his family is Greek, and Tarpon Springs is a giant Greek community. Oh, really? I didn't know they that. They have a condo in, in Clearwater, so they thought, ah, uh, you know, it'll be cool. There's a brewery in Tarpon Springs. We'll pick them up and distribute them a little bit. So I was all over it because I knew, you know, if we if we could hit Philadelphia, which is the Belgian beer capital, probably of the world now, probably even more than Belgium, uh, you know, things would, would explode. So we, we did that, sent them beer. Uh, from there, we were picked up by a, a big distributor in New York that, that uh, covered the five boroughs just because of the exposure in uh, Philadelphia. And then uh, we ended up with uh, Shelton Brothers. And, you know, that that saved us because we, we would have died, you know, very early on. Um, I remember, you know, a, a big month before that, uh, you know, just, uh, we would sell maybe 40 cases in a month which right. was, you know, definitely not enough to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I was still working full time at another job and running the brewery. But uh, yeah, it was it was tough uh, first few years. Yeah, that's I can imagine it's a lot of pressure. And I, I have my own business too, and it's 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 crazy. It's crazy. You, kind of, you almost kind of wish you had that fallback in the <laughs> in the beginning, yeah. like another job. Chase, did you have any of that? Did you did you have a uh, did you start Prairie All In, or did you have a uh, uh, you started kind of like one of these part-time breweries and kind of just all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I have to brew full-time to, to make this thing go. No, I went all in. So the biggest thing for me is like um, the Red Bud project I did half-assed and had another job. And um, it really took my, my mom and my wife pushing me to just go for it because I had been freaked out. Like I kind of went and – got hired for a job to be a brewmaster down in Dallas and we moved there and kind of realized that like starting a brewery for people that know less than me about beer but still have the courage to do it is, um, you know, why am I helping them out when I just need to be doing it myself? So kind of that and then my family pushing on me, I was like, well, for this time, why don't I just completely go for it and kind of see what happens? And, sure. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know the last uh, – I haven't been employed by someone for about two and a half years now or so, so it's been kind of cool. Feels good. Yeah, it is. I'm going back. You know, yeah, you, there's no – yeah, I, I think about that because, like, I'm just – like, I'll be such a bad employee for anyone that hired me, so. Right. <laughs> I think right. about that, and it's like I really don't need to screw this up because, like, going to work for someone else just, like, would not work. Man, after you work for yourself, there's like, how can you sit there and take orders from someone? Well, there's there's ups and downs, though. I mean, that being said, I'm, you know, guilty of being a workaholic from here and there and spending my days off. You know, we're, we're building out a new farm place, and I'm out there running the tractor for all day. So, um, you know, you can stop when you want to, but it's hard to stop. 
But it's got to be easier. For every brewer I've talked to, um, we talked to got any, anywhere from Night Shift up in Boston, Vince Tercy, uh, Wayne in Cigar City. Uh, I mean, any brewer. They love what they do. It's kind of like your day off spent working on your brewery isn't necessarily uh, a bad thing, or is it? It's only a bad thing, I guess, when, um, you know, you... <laughs> There's there's times when it's bad when um, you know you, breaks and you're spending the day there you know I got a three month old son now so my perspective has changed a little bit <laughs> sure. I'm a total workaholic to trying to trying to balance it out but sure sure I mean is it is it is it difficult to find balance I guess this is a question for both of you in life when you when you know uh, you guys are Basically, the um, determining factor in your product. Um, you guys don't go to work; your product doesn't come out. You know, the next big thing doesn't come out. Is it tough to find a balance in life between uh, spending time with your family, which is obviously important, and making sure that the next newest uh, beer that everyone's gonna go nuts for comes out? It is It is really um, because as we get back to joking around about being like beer famous or whatever. Um, which means not famous, really, um, is that... It's, Bob's it's, pretty famous. Both of you guys are famous. Well, Bob more so than me, but it... it no, just, it it's like being, you know, king of the geeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I heard somebody call the Bob... The guy in the chess club. Bob, you were called a legend the other day. He's earned that. <laughs> you were a legend. Yeah, what is that feel? Legend. He's earned it. But I guess what I'm My saying is... Winkle? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chase. No, it's just, it's, it's hard. It's just, it's, it's really hard to set it down because it becomes more of your lifestyle and identity than it is a job. You know, neither one of us go to a job. We, we keep this thing that is even bigger than ourselves moving and alive. And so it's, it's, it's really hard to, it's hard to put it down. Uh, right. it, it really is. Bob, to piggyback on that question, how much of you is Saint Somewhere? I mean, do you do you see the beer and the art that is your beer a, an extension of you? Uh, is that is that how close you are to this this product? Oh yeah, I, I man, I'd love to think so. Yeah. And how so? I mean, what is what are we seeing? In, what are we seeing in your beer that is Bob Sylvester? There's there are a lot of things that go into the beer and the package. And the whole concept that are that are 100 percent, you know, me and 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 Ann. Right. Um, we wanted everything we did to reflect, uh, you know, Florida, and not you know the, you know the the orange and alligator Florida, but you know the real Florida that that we know. So we, you know, try to incorporate, uh, you know, some There's some, wrong with some alligators in Florida. I'm, you know. Well, some some non-traditional Florida ingredients, let's say. Um, you know, we were nobody was brewing with hibiscus other than uh, Dude to Seal. That was the only hibiscus beer ever. So we, you know, we did a beer with hibiscus, uh, saw palmetto berries. Uh, you know, we try to use as much Florida as we can, and even into the the, the labels, uh, the names of the beer, saison a theme. Um, well, first off, all of our beers, we, uh, we try desperately hard to name them things that no one can pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> Athene, we get, you know, it's, it's, it's always Athens, uh, Athena, Athena, you know, they, they gets, gets butchered all over the place. <laughs> but the, the name Saison Athene, where that comes from, is, uh, a couple of things. Uh, it's a, somewhat of a tip of the hat to Tarpon Springs, which is a giant Greek community, but it really is part of the uh, scientific name for the Florida burrowing owl, which is a little owl that lives underground, uh, Athene caniculara floridensis. Yeah. Um, you know, Cynthiana, the grapes are grown in Florida that, that we use. We, we try to, you know, the wild yeast, the, the right. big part of that, and the open fermentation is really to just get as much Florida into each beer as we possibly can. Why is that so important to you? You know, I, I, I appreciate it, 
but but why is this such an important thing to create a Florida identity in your beer? Uh, I because I didn't want to do knockoffs of of Belgian beer. Uh, you know, I wanted to brew in, in that spirit, but I wanted it to be you know our own thing, and we wanted to have a you know a, a focus. And I and I, I I love Florida. I love living here. Uh, it's a very misunderstood stood state, except by the people who who live here. And, uh, <laughs> it, it's you know. Yes, it's a cool thing. It's very true. We were talking before the interview about how different different regions are in Florida, but everyone just kind of gets it. Yeah. You know, it's weird. Yeah, there's. I mean, you could you could split Florida down the middle, you know, through make Orlando the the center, and uh, the West Coast where I am is uh, predominantly Midwestern, Ohio, Michigan, uh, you know, even as far north as Canada. And uh, you know the East Coast where you are is predominantly New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia. It's you know Eastern Seaboard. Right. And uh, not by chance, but seventy-five comes down on this side. You know, ten and ninety-five comes down on your side. Sure. And it it just that's where people landed. That's where they went. Sure. Now I notice you guys have a lot of. Um History and and then there's a lot of cool stories by the names of all your beers. Was that a purposeful thing? Like Surge, um, for Bob, Surge is. Uh, you were telling me the whole story about Surge. I think it's a cool story. I want you to tell that myself. But, um, <laughs> is there is there a big is that, is that important to you to incorporate kind of these references in your product? Yeah, I, absolutely. Is that? Yeah, I, I spent enough time in retail. To realize that, you know, the product yes has to be good, but if the if the entire package is not good, then you're you're wasting your time. Um, so that's you know the, that goes to the labels, the bottles, uh, you know, the package, the presentation, the whole thing. Sure. Um, Surge, I, I deeply identify with Surge because he does a lot of things that I I would want to do, but you know, no better. Uh, for <laughs> most people out there aren't going to know who Serge is. Serge is a character from uh, Tim Dorsey novels, and he's written, I think, 15, 15 or 16 um, novels about the antics of, of Serge and his sidekick, uh, Coleman. And uh, Serge is just kind of a loser, you know, drug-addled, you know, vagabond kind of guy that... Uh, kills uh, bad people, people that do, you know, bad things to, to Florida, the, you know, the environment, uh, yeah, <laughs> bad things to other people, and he uh, dispatches them in all kinds of uh, interesting ways, and uh, we, I, I, I tried for about a year and a half to get a hold of Tim Dorsey, the, the author, and he, he just wouldn't, wouldn't reply, so I was going to change the name of the beer to something else. And uh, Ann said, no, just stick with Surge. You know, we'll bite the bullet if, you know, comes to it. We'll change it. Again. <laughs> so we, we put the beer out, and, like, immediately I get an email from Tim Dorsey, and he's like, I heard you put a beer out called Surge. And he was, he was thrilled to death. I mean, he couldn't believe it. <laughs> That's he awesome. He more openings. He did book signings. And, uh, yeah, Surge is uh, – Surge lives. <laughs> That's cool, but only for one more batch. Yes. So basically, everybody who um, likes Surge or hasn't had Surge, go and buy as much of it as possible because Bob is not brewing it anymore. <laughs> and and the uh, the label, um, what's on the label of Surge is a ghost orchid, which only grows in a couple hundred acre patch of the uh, Fakahatchee Strand in South Florida. And it, it played into one of uh, uh, one of the Tim Dorsey novels where Serge was involved in looking for a ghost orchid. That's really cool. I see that these are things that I really find are uh, you know interesting, and, and you've tied that into the way you brew the beer too, and the style of the beer. Yeah, yeah. Serge is a black saison, which is you know black, we 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 say it's black like Serge's uh, soul. There you go. Chase, you guys over there have a cool story behind your labels and um, 
your brother does all the labels for your for your for your beers, right? Yeah, it does. Um, it's awesome, you know, working with my little bro. Um, he finally graduated from college here about a month ago, so he's there every day now, full time, and we get to sit down on Mondays or even today. We sat down and caught up about the just laundry list of forever things that I need him to do because I mean, all we do is make new beers and play around. So he's just always busy with stuff. But that that was a big point for me is that we started Prairie and and when we started it, it was a big deal that my brother would be involved. And I told told him all about my idea, and the next morning he had drawn this drawing of these two prairie dogs together, and um, it was just awesome. And I was like, all right, we're going to do this. But even then, I had no idea of the craziness that that he would start producing. So um, it's just fun. And the biggest thing is is that I come up with beer ideas, concepts, opinions, and and, and brew them. And then I just tell them, like, oh, here's the name. Like, none of our beers have that great of names. Um, I usually pick something rather plain. But he just takes that idea and transforms it into something visually that I could just never do. And, and the thought is that I don't really tell him what to do, and he doesn't tell me what to do. And in the end, we create a product that is an expression of mine and and of his. How does that work? There's got to be some sort of an image that you're – you're picturing when you're when you're coming up with that beer. Now I just gotta let it go. Um, sometimes I'll help him brainstorm, but I think I just have to accept the fact that if we're both going to have the point of view and the product, then I need to let him do what he wants to do. And and I may not even necessarily agree with it on some things. We have a beer that's like the most elegant, beautiful beer I've ever made. It's it's a, a collaboration with Evil Twin. That's uh, like a hundred percent spontaneous, like lambic style beer, like, um, and we 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 cultured it in the in the metal metal uh, thing that was in the back of my pickup truck, and so it's called Cool Ship Truck. Um, but instead of like this elegant label that was maybe like not graphic heavy and just kind of pretty, um, it's like a scene from Mad Max, and um, completely not what I would have wanted. Um, but I had to embrace the fact that that's that's him kind of even playing to that idea of let's take something that's elegant and turn it upside down on its head. And, and, and so, so I just embrace it, you know, cause I think for him, it's, it's, it's art for him. Um, and, and, um, you know, if that's what he wants to do, then, then we roll with it. Cause I, I think we would, we wouldn't be honest to our, our goal. I think if, if, if I had to edit him too much, I like that. I think it's craft beer at its core. It's uh, doing, you know, like Bob, doing these traditional Belgian styles but making them Florida. And you guys are doing a traditional, classic, beautiful style and putting this crazy artwork on it. I've seen the artwork. Um, I think well, it's, it's really cool. It's <laughs> what's good when you have a you know, 25-year-old brother that's just like, really into into like just like crazy things and just the stuff that you know he works out in his brain and you know it's uh, what I would do and he would do are two very different things and and a great point of that is the Redbud project I know I keep getting back to it but I just find all those labels by myself and um, I realized that he was kind of the missing link in what I was trying to do to help get where Bob was saying in a total package of not just the product in the bottle but the experience someone has from seeing it on the shelf, looking at it, even opening it. Um, we used to cork and cage, and, and we don't anymore, uh, more for reasons that we're trying to um, meet a little more demand with the with this a crown bottle. But even things like that, that create a full experience when someone's drinking the beer that um, we identify as important and every day talk about how much we miss doing cork and cage bottles. Sure. And I guess that's a perfect time to say, I was going to say, this is the bottle. I did a bad job of saying it for, for the, what we're drinking, me and Bob, the Cynthiana. If you, can, if you can find this, pick it up. I normally do a much better job of reviewing the beer, but since we've got two of you guys and I have so much uh, I want to ask you guys, which we're not going to get to because it's just going to take too long. So hopefully you guys will do an individual interview too. Um, it's really cool to have that. Yeah, I mean, like you're saying, you got the 2013 on the cork, you know, saying somewhere. It, it, it is a cool thing. Uh, but I, you get, you got to understand both sides of it too. But yeah, and it, it, it's it's an expense <laughs> to be honest. Of course. Yeah. I, I feel like I feel like your I feel like your brewery was was meant to 
Um, yeah, well, let me, let me rephrase that. I feel like you, you've kind of taken the expense and the um, lack of ability to maybe produce as much as another brew would be able to produce to maintain that Florida Belgian style beer. Is that is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that you, you Bob gave me shit a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> Bob gave me shit one time because we bought a corker to cork our, our bottles versus doing them by hand. <laughs> See, these are the things that I want to hear from you guys. <laughs> I had to go through a lot of crap over the years. The, when, when, when I first released uh, our beer, I put them in green bottles because green bottles were the traditional bottle for Saison, and I got so much crap for that, we switched to brown. And uh, I've recently changed back to green. Green, yes. And, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm starting to see some other green bottles pop up here and there. I like yeah, people not liking it. We all love it, the green bottles. I'm I'm a big supporter of it. Um, people bitch about it, maybe the beer getting somewhat light struck, but um, to a degree, it's appropriate to the style, and 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 I, yeah. I like it. And I know I know other brewers that are even more popular than Bob or I that also are really thinking hard about possibly doing it because because they're into it as well. Who? Tom. Who? I'm not making that announcement for them whether they do or not. Because everyone's going to get mad about it. Like, uh, either we'll just way. Be trailblazers. Yeah, this is, I mean, that's, and that's, Bob's a trailblazer. And, um, <laughs> you know, I use some bottles that are antique green, but that's still kind of wimpy because it's pretty much just brown. Oh. But if, if, if you look at, you know, <laughs> the, the, the grand marks of the style, they're all in green bottles. And yes, um, Don Dupont, some green bottles. Any of them, you know. Yeah. Most most decent Belgian beer that's in a 750, they're they're in they're in the green bottles. Sure. And that just that little bit of, of light strike, which you know, let's say it, it's a flaw, but it also is a contributing factor to the you know the the, the style of the beer. Right. So we now take it back to green to be a little more authentic. Let's start a petition. Will you guys be the first one to sign it? The craft commander petition? Everybody must brew saisons and bottle them in green bottles? No, I'd, I'd rather I'd rather be contrary and <laughs> no, I'm I'm let them stay with their brown and I'll be green. <laughs> we'll be green. We'll have a little green bottle club. <laughs> there you go. Like I was saying before, we're not going to have enough time to get into each all the details I want to get into about you guys' is, if you've seen any, any of the other interviews, I, I kind of get, get really deep into people's breweries. Um, but I want to talk about your guys' collaborations, and I don't want to take up your guys too much of your guys' time and too much of people's time listening. Um, and so you guys have done three collaborations together, right? Yes. Okay. I, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> too bad. I'm running the questions here. What... What are, the, what are the three beers, and, and can people still... I mean, I know that... Bob, we talked about them a little bit, um, but most of them are only most of them were only available in Oklahoma, right? I would say um, only one of them was ever available in Oklahoma. Um, the only one that ever landed, and it's funny, yeah, cause people buy, buy the beer in like way other places like Chicago and Louisville and stuff like that. Um, the one we did definitely was in our state, but other than that, the other two never landed here. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm yeah. looking at, I got a bottle. One of one of the number two are one, depending on who you're asking. The one that came from Bob's Brewery, the first one, uh, I got one above my fridge right now. I'm looking at it. I never. He never sent me any of the third one though. <laughs> no, he I didn't. Nah. Tried it. I, we were at the. I, I did bring some to the festival. We tried it. I've had it, so I'm not. I'm not totally <laughs> mad about it. But <laughs> did any of it make its way down to Florida? Uh, I, I'm. I think it probably did. Uh, I don't know. Well, interestingly enough, the only one that was available in Florida was uh, was was, it was Prairie somewhere. Oh, the one where your head's sticking out of the sand. Yeah. Yeah, the other two, I, I, I just sent it, sent it all to Shelton Brothers. Oh, man. At least any of it in Florida. we got to do something about that. 
Chase, what I, was the I, deal? I, I, I get I get angry every once in a while and you know try to punish Florida and. I do that to Oklahoma too, and it always backfires. <laughs> well, yeah. Chase, your brother uh, Colin, um, yep. he drew you you up in the front of the bottle on the prairie somewhere, and Bob's head just sticking out of the sand. What's up with that? I, you know, like I said, it's it's one of those things where I I don't tell him what to do, so. <laughs> He, he, he put it in there, and, and I just had to keep my mouth shut about disrespecting Bob like that. Um, I thought it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Not only am I in the sand, but if, if you look closely at the label, I've got, you know, I've got gull crap on my head. Yes. Yeah, he was rough. And I, I don't – Colin met Bob after the fact, so. Oh, man. I was going to say, there's got to be an inside joke there, but he's doing it before he even knows him. <laughs> No, but Bob swore, like Bob met Colin in, in Maine last year and and swore he was uh gonna get his revenge, but I don't know if he ever quite did. But um, we certainly had fun. <laughs> That's an am- I looked at that label and I said, "Holy shit!" <laughs> Look at Bob's head just in the background. <laughs> well, the best part about the label that few people know is that. My body is based off of a photograph of Tom Selleck. Um, <laughs> look at it again, because um, he was generous. Down to the Hawaiian shirt, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, both of us are based off of Tom Selleck on the label. It's pretty funny. So, um, But I guess, I mean, the whole idea behind the beer was we would brew something with Florida-based ingredients, and then in the next one, Bob would ba- brew something with Oklahoma based ingredients. So ours was farmhouse ale that we brewed with uh, limes and oranges and um, added those in the kettle. And um, half of it was actually fermented with lactobacillus as well and then blended. So um, a super citric beer more or less. Sure. How important are, since, since we're talking about three people, three different collaborations between you guys, Collaborations, I don't know, for whatever reason, they're kind of like my, I love collaborations, the idea behind collaborations, but how important are they um, to craft breweries? Uh, you know, is it is it more of just a, this would be fun to work with this guy, and uh, he was so great as I was coming up, let me work with Bob, or is it is it something that you guys, um, it, that, that a young and aspiring craft brewery should do because it, it, it's, you're not only learning something, but you're associating yourself with somebody that you should associate yourself with. I mean, the idea behind a, behind a collaboration, that's, for some reason, I'm always interested by that. I think first and foremost, I, I would never recommend anyone do it for strictly for marketing reasons. Um, you know, I, I had my own personal ambitions and just my admiration for Bob to work with them, um, you know, and, and it never really had any thought of, oh, if I tie my name to him, like, it'll help us sell some more beers or something like that. I mean, it comes from us as more artisan brewers just caring to share our craft and, and our passions with each other versus, you know, we share the beers with everyone else, but, you know, our, our passion to brew the beers is a whole separate deal. Bob, what about, what, what about your take on collaboration? I don't know why, but collaborations to me are so interesting. I love seeing different breweries come together. Um, I, I'm sure there are some out there that, that are about marketing. You know, you see some of these, you know, collaborations with, you know, somebody that died 20 years ago or, you know, an <laughs> actor that, you know, to me those aren't collaborations. That, that's sure. marketing. But you know, the real collaborations. It, it like Chase said, it, it it's just fun. You know, it, it's a fraternity, and uh, you know, you want to see how somebody else, you know, gets to, you know, the 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 means to the end. And uh, I, I I don't think Chase learned anything from me. I think I probably set him back ten years. Uh-huh. <laughs> but we had a good time. Actually, it's a, it, it, it really is going to stay two days longer, but uh, we, the, the old man wore him out. He had to leave. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as the story goes, <laughs> yes, 
This is what I want. I'm trying to dig these stories out of you guys. We had lined up. Essentially, this is in the very. In, this is really early on in Prairie, and we had lined up a collaboration. And and I did it like. I mean, this is at a time where I'm dirt broke in starting this thing. And the reason I was even going to Florida is because my wife, who was working another job at the time, um, was going to a conference that was going to be in Clearwater. And so we had, like, you know, free lodging and stuff, and we're, like, only had to pay for my plane ticket, and it was going to be this, like, cheap and easy deal. And in the meantime, we realized how serious we're going to get about Prairie as far as, like, I, we were living in Dallas at this time. And... Um, like, I had just started to, like, work on getting Prairie off the ground. And um, in the meantime of her booking this and planning it, she quits her job knowing that we're moving back to Oklahoma to just have, you know, Prairie go full bore. So she's out of this trip, but yet I've still got a plane ticket and have made plans. Um, and it was also conveniently, um, like, right in the middle of it being spring break. Um, so there's... Computer's about to die here. Can you help me out? Um, sorry, a little assistance. So I, I'm still supposed to come down there, but there's like nowhere to stay because it's spring break, and this is a great place to go for spring break. Um, so needless to say, uh, Bob's able to find me a space in a bed and breakfast that's um, it's like medieval themed. Uh, um, and it, it, it was the house frau. Yeah, and this old German lady runs it, and needless to say, I went down there without my wife, like, just to just go figure this thing out, and, um, you know, Bob certainly showed me a great time, and, and, and it's funny, the place I miss most is the uh, the boat club, <laughs> which is a pretty unique <laughs> bar in itself, but so it was certainly... Talk about the boat club. <laughs> it's like Fight Club. <laughs> uh, there was this one place we liked. It was a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> about that. No, uh, it, fun. It was great just getting to work with him. And um, even even when we go to places like this, it's like with their community and stuff. Like he took me to the sponge docks and, um, you know, we ate at this, you know, one of the spots there that does the seafood and a lot of stuff just right out of the water there. And um, so... Beyond the time hanging out in the brewery, it was kind of getting to experience a little little piece of his world um, outside of it, and and it was an unusual circumstance for me as um, I came down there really with nowhere to stay, and um, he took care of me and certainly showed me a good time, and and from it, you know, we we we've, we've become come buddies from it for sure. It's cool. What this is, this is completely changing the subject. Sorry, um, but. Both of you guys, what is the favorite beer that you've brewed so far? I know Bob's answer to this. Um, and then what can people who are fans of your breweries look forward to in the future as far as a beer that you've conceptualized or already brewed that haven't, maybe haven't announced um, that is your favorite upcoming beer? I guess we'll start with Bob. Um... Well, I've, I've been the uh, the boy who cries wolf for like a year and a half now about moving. Uh, we keep, you know, getting on, on the edge and then, you know, pulling back. We're in between two different locations and waiting for one to change, and so everything's kind of in limbo. But once we do move, uh, I like to invest in, uh, in a couple of fooders and... God help me, a couple of conical fermenters, and I want to do, you know, hardcore beer to guard. Put a beer in a fermenter and let it sit there six months. Um, you know, just let it let a cold condition like a traditional beer to guard, and uh, you know, bottle condition it as, as normal and let it go from there. But the yeah, the the fooders I'd, I'd really like to do because they're barrel aging, but on a bigger scale, and they're sure. here to clean and deal with. Sure. What about the what about the favorite beer you've brewed so far? Um, probably Cynthiana. I well, that's a seasonal. My my favorite beer out of the whole whole portfolio, uh, I, I'd have to say like Tio Divina, which is confusing beer because it's 
it's a recipe, just a spot on recipe for a Belgian double, um, you know, akin to, you know, West Veteran 8 or, you know, St. Bernard's Prior 8, but I treat it uh, as a Saison. Um, low mash temp, Saison yeast, high temperature fermentation, so it, you know, you get, you get a little of the, uh, the double aroma, but you also get the, the Saison thing going on, bone dry finish, uh, that, that's, that's my personal go-to beer of mine. Um, I usually drink everybody else's beer more than my own, and that's the same with most breweries. Yeah. You, you get tired of your own stuff. How much inspiration, and before we go to Chase, how much inspiration do you draw from everybody else's beers? Is that something that's influential in what uh, you're, you're dreaming up next? Me or Chase? Yeah, before we go to Chase, oh. you said you drink most people, uh, mostly you drink other people's beer. How much of an inspiration is other people's beer? Uh, um, hugely. Um, I, I, I finally did, you know, decent pilgrimage to... Uh, Belgium and France last year, and it, you know, it was, you know, let, let's say being reborn, uh, you know, I, I, I knew the direction we were going in was the right direction, but uh, just the the whole thing, I mean, the, the community, the, it really, really focused me into where we want to be. Sure. Um, you know, and, and also got to brew, you know, a couple of pretty legendary breweries that, uh, you know, I would have only have dreamt about 10 years ago. Um, you know, hugely inspirational. That's, you know, beer church. Hallelujah. Which ones? <laughs> Which ones? Uh, Thierry, uh, Daniel, Daniel's uh, the man, and uh, Brasserie uh, Kazoo. Mm -hmm. Which is not as well known, but I, I, they do their saison kazoo to me is, is probably the best or definitely one of the best uh, in the world. It's fantastic. It's uh, just straight up saison with uh, elderflower, which you know I is close to me because I brew with elderflowers, and I felt right at home because they were just an old backwards farmhouse brewery <laughs> that, you know, I, I Chase can attest to it, you know, it, it, it's it's like brewing in the Stone Ages at St. Somewhere. You've got to have chairs in certain places to have the hose hanging over, and uh, <laughs> they were they were the same way, and I'm like, man, I, this is, I, I love this. Uh, this is me. That's really cool. Chase, what about you, man? What's your favorite beer you've brewed so far? Oh, wow. I mean, it's our first beer, Prairie Ale. Um, Oh, I love it. It's just a simple grain bill and then, um, you know, all like saws hopped and then bottle conditioned with Brett Brooks. And um, to me, it's it's really kind of, it gets overlooked in our lineup of beer just because, you know, we're always releasing something new. But for me, I mean, that's that's the flavor that initially inspired me to, to really move in that direction with beers and stuff. So I, I always go back to it and... Um, you know, I'm going to here soon actually have my brother. It was his first label, and it just doesn't fit his general style anymore. So he's going to redesign it, and and I'm going to offer it at a lot lower price um, just because I want to get that one out there and, and not let anything be too much of a pro prohibited, you know, people for – people to try it because I think it gets overlooked because it sits on the shelf right next to our brand new beer and people always want to grab that. So I'd love for that beer to be something that's much more part of our culture and, and, and our brewery than, than it is. And so it's, it's definitely my favorite and one I cheer for. And um, so I'm going to make efforts to revive it. And I don't know that it even really needs it, but I figured I might as well um, see if it makes a difference for people, you know, because it's a beautiful, it's an elegant beer where a lot of our beers are more or less can sometimes be statement beers where there's one underlying um, really intense note to it, and um, that's fun, but to me that that's, that's the one you can open every night um, and, and, and really enjoy. And, and it kind of more, I think, harkens back to some of the um, more traditional Belgian and French um, farmhouse beers, more so than my others. So 
that's why I kind of feel about that one. Yeah, it's a phenomenal beer. Now, is there any spoilers for those people who may want to know what Prairie is going to brew in the future? The stuff well, that we're right, conceptualizing. Right now, we have a like a more or less like a Belgian strong dark that we put as of yesterday into large sherry casks, um, which are just amazing, uh, you know, oxidized raisin and almond, really great flavors from the barrels. But one thing we are able to do when we did our Cool Ship beer was more or less capture that culture, and we're calling it our cowboy culture. Uh, so we were able to inoculate the beer with that, and that's that's the direction we're really going to start heading is – using that culture we were able to collect through doing the cool ship and, and integrating it into a lot of beers. So obviously there's the stuff that's 100% fermented by it, but then utilizing it as a way to create just super layered complex beers that um, really have you know a signature from where we are, as Bob was saying, with using his native yeast. Um, we're making then making beers that, that taste and are unlike anything else anywhere. So it's a direction we're going. We're moving our from our current facility to a 17-acre uh, farm um, that really helps embrace kind of where we are in, in the world. And um, we're growing things out there currently and utilizing that in beers. And cool. I think focusing on, on a word that I use lately, because we're experiencing a lot of growth, and sometimes it's really challenging for me to, to stay true to what we, I set out to do because – um, it's appealing to chase other things and, and do stuff and um, staying true to what we do is a challenge sometimes, but I feel like moving out there is going to get us closer to that and, and to what I believe is something that's truly authentic where it's easy to sometimes get into this you know mode of doing a lot of different beers and things that can sometimes just be kind of like your interpretation or copy off of something someone else has done. And sure. um, it's easy and it's appealing because, you know, it, <laughs> the thought's already done in it. But for us, moving out there and focusing more on the flavors that we can make, you know, naturally versus just, you know, coming up with stuff that's already been done is, is really a direction I need to need to head just for more of a personal, personal reasons rather than business reasons because, you know, we didn't ever set out to be something too huge. And unfortunately, it's kind of started to go that direction and I need to, reel it in and, and being out there will certainly help with that. I, I can appreciate that. I think that's why people are drawn to you guys' breweries so much is that you can taste in the beers that you're drinking that come out of both of your breweries that there is a definite um, intention to stay true to, um, to true to authenticity. Uh, I guess we could put it that way. There's a definite, you know, when you drink a St. Somewhere beer, you drink a, a, a prairie beer, you're, you're drinking something you say, wow, I mean, this is this is not a, a, something that is ever meant to be completely mass-produced. This is this feels right. Uh, this feels like I can taste Bob and Chase's hands in this beer. Um, is that kind of the intention that you guys both wanted uh, when you set out to start a brewery? Um, was it always... We've got to maintain this identity. We've got to maintain uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, that. I guess the, I guess the word that you both are using is authenticity. It's it's two different things for us, really, because Bob is entered doing his brewery, you know, at a different time point in his life than than I have. And so when we get down to like the realness of the situation, is is that I started Prairie at like 27 years old with zero money, and so. It's appealing sometimes to make stuff that I can just sell a ton of and help build our company and make money. And um, yeah. so that's hard for me to stay. It's harder, I think, probably for me to stay true to our roots and what we're trying to do than maybe it is for Bob. But I know visiting his place and then visiting a place like Jester King um, or even a place like Hill Farmstead, um, I could feel the authenticity in what was being done. Um, and so it's something we see in other breweries and strive for um, because for us it's it's easy. Um, when I say us, it's really me. It's easy to sometimes lose focus of that. So um, kudos to the, all of them for being able to, I think, accomplish that. Right. And it, it 
frankly, it, it's it's tough in this market because there are so many flavored beers. Let's say. Let's call let's call them like I said. Like I've said in some of the articles no, on my, on my website. Not non authentic. Gimmicky beers. Are, you know, they're they're killing it. You know, they're right. you know selling like like gangbusters and. I'm I'm a I'm a huge proponent of that, and I've I've never hidden that fact. Uh, I think you know we're 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 craft beer is right now. We should be getting so far away from all that stuff and getting you know more towards you know what what we're doing. You know the 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 craft of it, the more authentic. You know, get the most out of the grain and the yeast that you can before adding. You know, syrups and extracts. I, I, I posted on uh, on my Facebook page a, a while ago, and people, a lot of people, gave me a lot of crap for it. Uh, I just as an idea, I put it out there. What, how do you think? Uh, what kind of an idea do you think this is for sure? Uh, no flavors, no syrups, no extracts. You know, no bullshit. <laughs> and uh, rather than people going, "Yeah, man, that's great," I. People gave me crap for it. You know, why are you hating? What you know, you know what what you know? Why are you being so negative? I'm like, what do you mean negative? <laughs> you know, do you, do you think of you know uh, Lafitte Rothschilds adding raspberry extract to, to one of their wines and having it you know be world class or you know Opus One with you know peanut butter extract? It, it's nonsense. That <laughs> that seems to be you know taking hold in. <laughs> What's called a craft industry? That's not craft. That's that's pandering. I'm guilty of it recently. Um, we can now make low point beers to sell on site. Again, one of our rough laws is um, I can make four percent beers to sell on site. And I recently made a chocolate milk stout, um, aged on organic chocolate and everything with lactose. So I guess there's nothing too artificial about it. But it just no, gets I, away. It gets I, away from I, the sort of thing. And it was a throw. It was a, it was a nod. Well, it began as a nod to Miami. There, uh, we were going to call the beer uh, Presidential Tint uh, after Riff Raff, um, which I think both of you are proud of. Um, but we realized that that would maybe wouldn't hit a lot of our consumers, and so we just changed the name to Limo Tint. Um, and it's an amazing, it's a great tasting beer, but it gets so far away <laughs> um, from I think what I set out to do. It's like um, it's, it's again where I, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to, with, with what's going on in this industry to, to stay focused because throwing stuff out there like that can be fun and appealing, but it gets away from the original vision. It's difficult, I, I imagine, to balance that. I mean, I mean, if you know, if you know one, be, if you know you produce a beer like that, it's going to make you, you know. A uh, hundred thousand dollars, and you know whatever. It, it's it's got to be difficult to to hold yourself back from producing if you know you can do it well. <laughs> so I can appreciate that difficulty there, but I, I well, also you know it's of, like you know the 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 up and coming band that gets an offer you know to have one of their songs on a TV commercial. You know you it, it, it's a tough tough decision to make. Either you know stay true to your roots and be poor. <laughs> or you know you, you take the check and you're you know then you're called to sell out. I you know that, that's. Well, I, I don't hate your shirt idea. I think it's pretty cool. But I, I you know I, as far as authentic ingredients, that's perfectly fine. But you know there there's there's a lot of syrups and extracts being thrown around out there that I'm I'm you know just not okay with. Well, you know what? It's I I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, I think I think the art the art of creating a beer that is uh, that is well crafted without the need for a, for a syrupy extract added in uh, is somewhat being lost uh, yeah. somewhere in the shuffle. Um, but that said, um, luckily, um, both of you guys are producing really high quality beers that aren't gimmicky, as I put them. Um, and so I'm really, uh, I guess, what's the word for it? Honored to be able to be able to talk to you guys tonight on this, on this interview, or I call them conversations. I don't really like to think about interviews. Um, 
<laughs> so I hope we can do more in the future that actually focuses more on each individual brewery. But I guess originally for the backstory behind this inter behind this conversation was I had talked to Bob about doing something, and Bob was like, "Yeah, great." And then we started talking about all the collaboration between you and Chase. And then I kind of jokingly said, why don't, why don't we put Chase on it? And thinking Bob's going to say, no, you know, why don't you interview? He's like, no, let's do it. Let's do it together. That'd be so much fun. So, <laughs> so we invited Chase, and Chase said yes. So I, I want to thank you guys both. Um, you guys are both, I mean, coming from somebody who home brews, um, you know, obviously I don't have a brewery or anything. I, I, I brew on a, as a hobby. Um, but both are very inspirational in the way I brew. Um, so thank you for for that, and um, I'm honored to be able to feature you guys. I hope we can do something in the future where, well, Chase is at a 10 question on the site. Bob, we got to get you to do a 10 questions for the site. Um, and um, the answer to all 10 is no. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, and so you know, I. I I really hope that you guys um, continue to stay true to what you guys are saying uh, has been your identity and your um, the the motivation behind your brewery because so far uh, you know obviously um, people have have gravitated to your beers and there's a reason for that and so um, you know in the future I hope we continue to have Saint Somewhere and Prairie be in the forefront. Um, Prairie, you know, you guys are harder to find down here. Um, hopefully, we find more of you guys down here. Some of those, some of those beers that uh, you were drinking tonight, I have never seen in my life in person. Uh, hopefully, one day we find those down here. Um, but you you know, just, thank you guys for doing what you're doing. To this market more often. Yes. Maybe we'll, you guys need to call Sheldon Brothers. We'll get him on it. Get Ryan on it. Um, we need yeah. to just do. We'll just do another collaboration. I've been dying to get back to Florida. Um, we need to do but, Saber. Well, Saber, yes, 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 yes. So let's let's uh, we'll start that discussion. My biggest thing is having this baby. Um, <laughs> it really puts a damper on traveling. Uh, but <laughs> Under he's getting older. There. He's getting older, and we're hurting bad to get get out somewhere. So maybe, hopefully, and you know, in the next six months or so we can line something up and and get back down there because it, it, it's definitely definitely worthwhile to make the trip Chase you gotta do something down in Miami man we can host you okay we'll put you up man we'll host you oh well, well we can certainly line that up I, I Bring the family. We'll, do a, we'll do a prairie event somewhere okay that'd be awesome maybe you guys can come down together when you do your collaboration we can do that We'll do saber fest and it will get real dangerous real fast. <laughs> we'll have saber fest. Yep. That's awesome. All right, guys. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Um, and so, yes, you can find both of these beers. Uh, contact uh, Shelton Brothers to figure out where you can find Saint Somewhere, where you can find Prairie. If you haven't had Saint Somewhere or Prairie, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, both of these breweries are producing really high, high quality beers. Bob, by the way, is this available still? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm uh, brewing that again um, this week on Friday. Great. So yeah, if we, we do it, we do it annually because the grapes are only available once a year. So uh, 2014 will be out yeah, in about a month. Great. So if you haven't had this beer, um, drink it. Uh, find it. Drink it. And basically, if you can find Prairie down in Miami or anywhere you can find, pick up a Prairie beer. Do yourself the service picking up a Prairie beer and trying that because they're they're out of this world. Both of you guys are doing awesome things. Bob the legend, you know. Uh, so, guys, thank you so much. Um, hopefully, we do something in the future and have a great night. Cheers. Cool. Thanks for having us. Cheers.